Welcome back to the Six Piece Podcast. Today we're looking at Chapter 10 from The Longest Memory. This is the final of Lydia's th- three chapters. And in this one, her relationship with Chapel will continues. In fact, it continues to grow. And at this very time, prospective bachelors are presented to Lydia to marry. And she finds it very difficult to pick one because she keeps comparing them to Chapel. Now, Lydia's brother returns home from a trip north where he explains the fact that formerly enslaved humans are in relationships with white women. And while this disgusts him, it provides Lydia and Chapel with a clear and realistic dream to escape to the north in order to continue and in fact deepen their relationship. When it comes to the key themes, we're definitely looking at racism and discrimination. We're looking at family, freedom and equality as well, but particularly freedom because the dream and their aspiration to go north is all about firstly to an extent chapel's freedom and escaping his enslavement but also freedom for them both to be in a free and open and loving relationship with one another chapter 11 lydia i grow into a woman and know this only because others tell me repeatedly my preoccupation with chapel is such that i fail to see what father truly means when he says young lady instead of child or Lydia or my dear girl and stops hugging me. Mother has started making more and more of a fuss about my etiquette, my carriage, my composure. She tells me to make smaller steps when I walk. She has me cross the room and says I stride like my father. Then she minces the 10 feet marked out for this absurd exhibition and clearly her manner is false. I try to object, but she insists that I actually shuffle along with my Shakespeare volume balanced on my head my brothers and father applaud. I want to run from the room, but decide to entertain them. I take a bow. I add to the Shakespeare, the works of Milton, and I prance the 10 feet without them shifting an inch. Again, there is applause, but mother shouts something about less bounce. I add Spencer to the top and try to glide across the room, but only get three quarters of the way before Spencer wobbles, then slips and slides off my head, followed by Milton and the Shakespeare which I managed to catch. This time, there is much applause and loud laughter. Chapel says nothing to me. Our hands explore each other's bodies in the dark. We carry on with our talk, memorizing each other's lines throughout. His hands are not so much interested in my body as curious about where the curves and downy hair end once they begin. His mind is always set on saying the next line or getting me to repeat what he has composed and dictates to me. It may be that his hands are as busy as his tongue. The fact is, I don't recall the slightest hint of discomfort, shame or violation. The lady I have become has crept up on me. A consequence of all this talk about my carriage as a lady is a stream of visits to the house by eminent eligible young men. Their excuse is this or that manner of business with my father or elder brother, Thomas, but they make sure they stay for dinner or take tea when I'm about to take tea and switch their talk from whatever pressing business got them to the house to me. This may sound unfair. I hold each of these men up beside chapel to see how they compare. Not one has his wit, intelligence, charm and sensitive nature. Not one. Many of them are coarse in their humour and lewd in their suggestions, which they try to dress in metaphor, but only manage to drape in rags. They boast about money, acreage, slaves and their accurate pistol shot. A few mentioned books, but only after I steer the conversation repeatedly towards the importance of libraries, literacy and numeracy. When it comes to the rights of slaves, I part company with every one of them without exception. One even argued that my pretty head should not be preoccupied with the business of men and certainly not be ached with improving the lot of slaves who are in their transportation from Africa are plucked from unutterable displays of savagery and barbarism. The well which produces these streams of young men does not dry up. Eventually, Father calls me into the quiet of his study and inquires about my happiness as he lights his pipe and puffs on it, creating clouds of smoke that fall like a curtain between us. I say I am as happy as a daughter can be who is blessed with her health and two loving parents and brothers. He asks if my interests do not breach out further than the house. I say my limbs are still growing and I hope their reach will one day exceed the threshold of this house father is not satisfied. He says he is glad to hear it, but wishes to see the whole enterprise accelerated. 
I say it is a shame to force a sapling to become a tree before it is ready to blossom. He agrees wholeheartedly, but there is some irritation in his voice when he adds, between much sucking on his pipe, that there is much healthy light and food for a plant out of the doors rather than in. I promise I will seek out this sustenance since it is not in the interest of a young sapling to wither and perish in the dark. I'm sure I detect a frown as I excuse myself, swivel on my heels, and exit in neat little strides without the trace of a bounce in any of them. I do not feel any form of pressure until mother starts on me. She goes through the entire list of nine young men and wants to know exactly what put me off about each one. I faint a yawn, but the truth is I am seething at the imposition. She contradicts me when I say so-and-so was garrulous about himself without the benefit of having had a proper life to boast about or that X is relentless treatise on money was a bore. Pardon me, young lady, but in my humble estimation, a man who can converse is a social asset. And furthermore, money, despite all the boredom it holds for you, opens the doors to an illustrious life for a lady. I excuse myself from the drawing room, go straight to my room, fling myself on my bed, bury my head in my pillow and cry. Chapel, chapel, I wish you could waltz into my house and hold forth in my company before my father, mother and brothers the way you do with me. I wish you were white. It is a miserable time to be me. I wish I could be with chapel. I wish I were black. Am I ungrateful, God? Have I been cloistered too long in a world my two parents now wish me to flee? What can a lady of modest means do in this world without a protector, benefactor and companion? Chapel, I wish you were white or I black. Thomas's return from the North saves me. He tells me stories of free blacks associating with white women. There is so much venom in his tone and such distaste etched on his face that I faint shock and horror, but cover my mouth to describe what might well break out as a smile. These liaisons are open and tolerated by large sections of educated society who deplore the existence of slavery and ad advocate freeing slaves and paying them sums for their labour. Unworkable, impractical, idealistic. When they can keep their streets clean, they can lecture me about slavery. Yes, brother, of course, but we're precisely in the North, New York, Boston. I see Chapel walking arm in arm down one of these dirty streets with me. Chapel and I under the same roof. Chapel and I in the same bed. I tell Chapel about this heaven on earth on our next meeting. He does not seem to hear. He wants something from my head I had promised to memorise, but forgot to do in time for the occasion. Shakespeare's sonnet number 19. I tell him the previous 18 should prove sufficient to revise in his head until we meet on another clear night. He is not satisfied. He asked me if I had been especially preoccupied by the stream of suitors at my door, too much to bother with a piffling sonnet, I mere 14 lines, requested by one who is and remains, for all pretensions to be otherwise, an ordinary worthless slave. I tell him to desist this nonsense. I remind him of the first two books of Paradise Lost, laboriously committed to my memory and meticulously transferred to his. I remind him of all those iambic pentameters and rhyme speeches plucked from Shakespeare's plays, of long passages from Spencer's Fairy Queen, or of the Homer and the Virgil, or Goethe's Faust. Need I go on? I will go on. The Don poems, the bawdy Chaucer that made me blush and preserve for his sake. Pierce Plowman not to mention the hundreds of lines he composes. He puts his fingers over my lips, and for the first time in our meetings, he spins me around to face him in defiance of his father's ban. He kisses me on the lips, cheeks and forehead between telling me that he cannot live this way. My darling, I agree. I urge him to think about the North. I relate my brother's story again, this time furnishing him with every detail as it was told to me. Chapel says this journey for a lady would be hazardous, but for a slave, positively calamitous and therefore unthinkable. Where would we meet if we travelled separately? How would I contrive my, to my parents to allow me to go to the North? What means would we procure for our livelihood in a place neither of us had seen before? What was a route to this place? I said I knew nothing of the answers to his questions, but I could find out. 
We become excited and we hug, look at each other and hug again. Then Chapel becomes despondent and lowers his chin to his chest. I take his head in my hands and lift his face to mine. I don't know how many kisses I plan on his lips, but I continue until he smiles. He says he was hoping it would not come to this, that he would have run, that he would have to run away and disobey his father, my father, and leave his adoring mother. Then he adds, without hesitation to draw a breath, that his love for me is such that no one, not his father, not my father, not the threat of the overseas whip, nor his mother can stop him from doing what is necessary for us to be together. That is it. North, here we come. Prepare to receive two new guests. I leave chapel and return to my room and lie awake the rest of the night, thinking about how we can do this incredible thing. At each turn, I come to a wall that is too long to walk around and too high to scale. The wall says this thing cannot be done. So I take another turn and get some way along the road of my reasoning when a second wall presents itself to me and again says even this new method cannot work. But I do not give up. I turn away and find a new path. One untrodden, one I work hard to clear little by little. The shutters are open. I can still see stars. They grow dim, then pale as dawn advances. Then they withdraw as dawn unleashes the sun on a world trying to hide its many imperfections with the brilliant glow of sunlight on dew sweated overnight. My elder brother is ready to make one of those occasional trips to the north. Thomas goes to New York and Boston to buy materials needed on the plantation and to meet with our investors and to check on our investments. I ask him if he will, he will consider taking me. He refuses outright. With that mannerism of that betrays exactly what is on his mind in the expression on his face, in this instance, a scathing sort of dismissal in his contorted features and a general astonishment in his wide eyes that would even dare to broach the subject with him. I swallow my rage and persevere. Can he not use me at any of his social engagements? For example, a business colleague might be with a wife whom I could preoccupy while he got on with business. He puts down his pen, turns bodily from his papers and, for a moment, appears to consider the originality of my suggestion, but then shakes his head negatively, saying it cannot work because it will require a lot of planning in little time. Next thing, Father asked me what prompts my interest in the North. I did not expect Thomas to mention our conversation to Father. Thus, I am taken aback by Father and have no ready answer. Nevertheless, I managed to say I have met all the men the South has to offer and frankly, I'm not impressed and think it's fitting to search further afield. Father bellows at this and takes both my hands and says he is proud of my wit and intelligence and, were I not his daughter and his youngest, he would put me in charge of his affairs. He says if Tom agrees, to it he has no objection. Then he says he can foresee no problem that cannot be surmounted except possibly one. I ask what, and he replies, my mother. He's right. The moment mother hears about it, she says no. No, no. No daughter of hers will be sent to a strange city where the families are not known to us to risk her honour and the family name. Tom unexpectedly says on my behalf that he knows many of the best families through his business dealings with them. That will simply not do, retorts mother. This is an affair concerning her only daughter and not some slave stock, harvest stock, trade sharehold or any such impersonal business. Then she glares at my father for some backing. Father holds his head in his arms at this point and shakes it from side to side. Mother paces up and down. Her face is vermilion. I look at Tom and William. Both cast me looks of, say something to calm the situation manufactured by your ambition. I say to mother I will do whatever she thinks fit to make this journey safe for her only daughter, who is as concerned as she obviously is about her reputation and that of the family name. My brother's groan. Father shakes his head with more vigour, and mother's colour deepens to crimson. But you interrupt me, I blurt out. I mean to say mother should accompany me. My brothers stare at me. Father drops his arms and looks up, and mother stops in her tracks as if she's walked into a wall, but instead of a groan, she smiles. Father and Tom and Willie look at her, then they smile, and then we all laugh. I do everything in my power to suppress my horror at the suggestion that has passed from my lips. I leap from my chair and hug Mother. As far as Chapel is concerned, our plan has backfired on us. My mother will soldier me day and night until we pray to be back on the plantation. I'm annoyed at his resignation. After all, 
I've achieved. This is the best response he can muster. I tell him he is mistaken. If he casts his mind back over the last few years, what manner of life did he, which is a totally new situation, cannot improve upon. He smiles, apologises and we embrace for a long time, as if the whole plan had been laid out and its execution is imminent. Tom furnishes me with as many facts as he has at hand. I am careful to inquire about accommodation in terms of my own comfort. If a slave were to accompany us, where do state slaves sleep? He said many whites travel with attendants who are accommodated in holdings appropriate to slaves. I ask him if it is custom for any blacks to travel alone. He said no, since they are prone to such harass much harassment from opportunists who frequently apprehend them, rob them, beat them, and try to sell them, even if they protest they are free. I see poor Chapel in this predicament. Tom says he is puzzled by my interest in details he considers to be at the periphery of our undertaking. After all, the most we will take is a woman to help mother and me. Naturally, but my fear is that if I were to witness such a gross injustice, I would be compelled to intervene on behalf of the poor victim. He understands and hopes I would leave such acts of chivalry to him. Naturally, dear brother, so he did not need a man to help him. No, there are people at each inn who help with the bags and run errands. He wants me to leave him alone. He shows this by raising both eyebrows and sighing. The expense, he adds, in this adventure of mine is considerable. Father and William will be with us as far as Fredericksburg, then we will proceed to New York and Boston by ourselves. If I leave the planning to him and concentrate my efforts on gathering the correct clothing for the cooler climate, it would be a great help. How much cooler? Poor chapel. First highway robbers and abductors, now the weather. Considerably is his only distracted answer as he returns to shuffling his papers. Chapel is glad to hear about the accommodations that are available for. I promise to give him money for his food. He resolves to be suitably attired. We talk about our life in the North, childish things really, such as what hour we will choose to go to bed when the necessity to meet in the dark on starlight nights is removed. We joke about associating with only the other couples similarly disposed as ourselves, that is, with an equal dis distribution of the two races between them. Our children, we stop. The words hang in the air, two stars that have dropped from the heavens to a point just above our heads and as bright as two suns. Our children, yes, our children. Several of them. Chapel says he will write verses for a living. Verses for the birthdays of dignitaries. Verses for the death of prominent citizens. Verses to commemorate the anniversary of this or that institution or brotherhood. Verses for a gentleman to woo his lady. Verses on religion. Verses on the bounty of nature. Verses, verses, verses. And will you have the time or inclination to write a stanza or two for your dear wife? Or will you be too tired wooing the entire city of souls? There is no verse, he says, fitting to express the depth of his feeling for me. Were he to write me a verse every day for the remainder of his life, those verses would amount to one bucket from an ocean of his deep feeling for me. Chapel, you will write verses and make our lives and the lives of our children rich. So let's have a look at some of the key quotations from this particular chapter. And a lot of them do have to do with Lydia and Chapel's relationship. So the first one, this may seem unfair. I hold each of these men up beside Chapel to see how they compare. And not one has his wit, intelligence, charm and sensitive nature. And I really like this quote because it shows Lydia is quite virtuous, but at the same time, quite innocent as well. And I think she's quite strong. The fact that she's able to rebuke the eligible bachelors um, shows, I guess, her courage in standing up against what is expected of her. And of course, literally, they are to an extent objectifying her and trying to, to find her the most, I guess, prominent or uh, um, eligible bachelor. The next quote, Chapel, Chapel, I wish you were white. I wish I could be with Chapel. I wish I were black. Am I ungrateful, God? Really showcases her hopelessness. And these are the consequences of racist society, which forbids you know, something so pure as the love between Lydia and, and Chapel. The next quote's a bit of a callback, actually. 
Uh, this is about uh, Thomas, her brother, when he returns from the north. And Lydia says, he tells me stories of free blacks associating with white women. There is so much venom in his tone and such distaste etched on his face that I feign shock and horror, but cover my mouth to disguise what may very well break out as a smile. This is a callback to when Lydia is reading in, or reading in the reading room in, in the study and she catches glimpses of chapel and she reads to chapel and she has to try and hide her true emotions. And once again, I've written here that Lydia's pure love for chapel is suppressed. She's forced to hide how she really feels. And this suppression is not just one that, again, it's enslaved humans have a feel, it's also women in this case feel that suppression as well. They lack power and agency over their own life. I see Chapel walking arm in arm down one of these dirty streets with me. Chapel and I under the same roof, Chapel and I under the same bed. Uh, this is obviously a quote that really reflects the hope that she feels. Her brother's anecdote and stories from the North provide her with a real and tangible dream and goal, which of course she then passes on to Chapel. And this is where she says, I tell Chapel about this heaven on earth. The text Paradise Lost is mentioned here as well. Paradise Lost is um, a poem by Milton and it tells the story of, I guess, Adam and Eve who were in the Garden of Eden and how through committing a sin, paradise for humanity was lost. It's really worthwhile looking into and making the connection between Paradise Lost and Chapel and Lydia's relationship. Similar to the intertextuality of Romeo and Juliet and the idea of star-crossed lovers. Unfortunately, this heaven on earth, which seems so close to Lydia and Chapel, won't come to fruition. And of course, we already know that through the dramatic irony, which we'll touch on a little bit later. The next quote is, his love for me is such that no one, not his father, not my father, not the threat of the overseas whip, nor his mother can stop him doing what is necessary for us to be together. And that is it. It's love. It overcomes all barriers that is placed in front of these two characters, whether it's racism, gender, family, and fear. Another idea is injustice. The injustice that this relationship can't continue and that they need to flee their family, flee a loving environment in order to be true to themselves. <clears throat> Second last quote, he's proud of my wit and intelligence and were I not his daughter and his youngest, he would put me in charge of his affairs. The reason I've raised this quote is gender, because once again, it's Lydia who suffers and is treated unfairly due to this. She's empowered to an extent though when she meets the bachelors and she sort of rebukes them, which I think is really good. Um, but again, she is at the whim of her, particularly her, her father. And once married, of course, then she'll be under the control of her husband. And the last quote, which links into the idea of dramatic irony, is the fact that, quote, Chapel, you will write verses and make our lives and the lives of our children rich. We know this isn't true. We know that Chapel dies. So again, it emphasizes, um, I guess, the sympathy that, 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 that we have. And I'm just writing that it's heightened by Chapel's poetry earlier in the text. So in his chapter, obviously, Chapel, he writes in verse, so we know what he's capable of. And unfortunately, the rest of the world won't get to see that. In terms of making connections between chapter 10 and the seven stages of grieving, this will probably be a little bit repetitive because Lily's had sort of three of the last four chapters. But I mentioned the idea of hope and hopelessness. So with hope, which is Chapel and Lydia's hopes for the future, free from racism, is mimicked in the atmosphere of the closing scene in the play, which is the reconciliation scene and the woman's excitement that she feels when she's marching across the bridge. What I would say to this, however, is the nonlinear structure and dramatic irony of the novel differs given the audience knows Chapel's fate. So while we understand that for Chapel and Lydia, their relationship won't come to fruition, as opposed to reconciliation and the march where there is a real optimism and sense of hope that change might, might occur, that it is a little bit different here. What I will say is there's hope for the society though, given we understand the historical context and given we know what's gonna happen later on in the 19th century. But again, a bit of a difference to look at in terms of how the structure of the novel means we don't have as much hope leaving it as we would with the play. And with the hopelessness, I've just written there, Lydia and Chapel's relationship versus the death of Daniel Fock. 
that sense of inevitability in fighting against oppression. And unfortunately, you know, Daniel Rock and Chapel both die, um, both at the hands of violence from authority figures. Chapel and Daniel Vocker are two characters which I would definitely recommend you compare at some stage, particularly with themes such as power, violence and oppression. I also wanted to mention this idea about defiance um, because there is a quote about defiance that comes up in, in the text, in, in the novel that I just read before. And I felt like it really links in well with this quote from scene 15, which is the march. And the quote for that is, from the media, I should say, it's called a defiant Aboriginal march. And later on, the narrator says, don't tell me we're not fighting. Don't tell them we don't fight most of our lives. This need to, to defy, whether it's family, whether it's the codes and conventions of society, the need for defiance in order to attain change, in order to attain justice. And that's really, really, really important. The other idea you could mention, obviously, is love. And we've looked at this a couple of times already with Lydia's chapter. Um, but in terms of the idea of love, the power of Chapel and Lydia's relationship is set against the backdrop of overt systemic racism. And I think Home Story showcases similar in terms of the kinship relationships that are really, really important to First Nations people and the idea about how they are eradicated by this oppressive, in this case, government society. So love is also something else. Love against the backdrop of racism is something else you could look at. But again, we have mentioned that in previous scenes. Anyway, that's all for today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on the Six Ps podcast.